those of you who are here to hear me talk about Lightroom and all of the wonderful tools that it has are going to be slightly disappointed. I am going to talk about Lightroom. I'm going to talk about uh, processing images in Lightroom. However, uh, this is creative workflow in Lightroom, and that's a slightly different thing uh, because I really am interested in why we do things in any processing software, not so much how. Uh, if you understand why you want to do something, then it's sort of much easier to figure out how to do it versus if you know how to do something, then you just wind up uh, going around in circles figuring out, well, why should I use this tool? But here it is, it's so cool, so let me see what it does and, and how I can play with it. And so I think that the, how, the, the why is the, the critical aspect in terms of being able to creatively uh, process images, especially these days where we're starting out with these raw files that seem like they have a myriad of possibilities and so many different directions to go in. I think that, again, it gets back to the vision. It gets back to the, uh, the, the photographic vision that you have in the field. And so there's a couple of concepts that I want to start out with uh, before we get into actual Lightroom. And I also want to show some examples. Like I said, why is more important than the how? And I think that's the first critical thing to understand about workflow and, and workflow in terms of processing images. A great uh, quote that, I, that I've always liked is, workflow is a flexible series of steps that one follows to efficiently and accurately realize your vision. And if you think about those different concepts uh, really carefully, each one of those words is pretty important. Uh, it needs to be flexible, okay? It needs to follow a series of steps. It needs to be efficient and accurate, all right? And those are the things that lots of times are difficult for all of us to implement because we, we lack in one of those areas. Either we're not efficient or we're not flexible or we're not accurate. We're not getting the photograph that we want. We're not, getting the, we're not achieving uh, the vision that we had when we took the image in the field when we're back in Lightroom. All right? And so I think that, again, it's really important to think about these kinds of ideas. Uh, workflow starts in the field as far as I'm concerned. All right? When you're in the field taking a picture, uh, that's when your workflow starts because at that moment is when you should start, when you take the pictures, when you should start to think about what the final version is going to look like. Not necessarily way before then, but right when you're taking the picture because that's the moment when you feel the impulse to press the shutter button. And that should carry on into the processing. It shouldn't be two separate and distinct things. When I've talked about uh, printing here in the past, I've, I've talked about this idea that we say, well, we, make, you know, we capture the image and then we do the post-processing, like it's two separate steps. And how can it be if the vision should be the same in both cases, whether you're making the picture or you're editing the picture, you're processing the picture. So four concepts that I want you to think about or that I want to emphasize. One is workflow starts at capture, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago. That's when you should start to really form in your mind what you want the image to say, uh, how you want it to look, of course, but also more than how you want it to look, what you want it to convey. Vision drives the editing, uh, which means, again, when you sit down to edit, you should have a vision in your mind already. Um, if you don't have that vision in your mind, uh, all is not lost. I mean, it doesn't mean that you should stop editing. Sometimes you may get that as you're editing, but it definitely helps. All right, I'm talking about a, a sense of having kind of a roadmap of where you want to take the image. And then the tools become a lot more accessible to you conceptually because then you know how, what tools you need to do in order to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Now, what's the, what's the, the point of any, any successful editing, any processing of an image is to lead the viewer, at least in my case. And everything that I want to talk about today is in terms of my own approach based on my work and also the examples that I'm going to show. That doesn't mean that it's correct for everyone else. But in terms of my case, uh, I want to lead the viewer. I want the viewer to see what it is that I'm seeing and experiencing. All right? And so my editing choices are going to try to reflect that, are going to try to get the viewer to draw the viewer's attention towards certain things in the image that, uh, that are essential to whatever, whatever it is that I'm trying to convey. So that's kind of the, the, the point, is to lead the viewer. And finally, you want to lead the viewer because you want to share your perspective. You want to share what it is that um, made you press the shutter button in the first place. All right. So all those things together, I think, are what uh, can create 
a creative workflow, when I talk about a creative workflow versus just sitting down, here's an image, and you start moving buttons and knobs around and experimenting with the latest how-to techniques or whatever. So I, I, I want to go through a, a series of images uh, before we get into Lightroom and show you the before and the after, and then talk a little bit on each one about what I was going for. And all of these images, the processing was done in Lightroom. So you can see more or less what's capable, uh, what you can do, and, and the power that's there, again, if you understand the tools. So this is, I'm going to show the, the before and the after, and then I'll show a comparison. This is the before image, all right? And that's the after image. All right, and the idea here was to draw the viewer's eye to the connection between the flowers and the hole in the arch. This is bow tie arch out in, in, in the southwest, and so I wanted to make this connection. That's what I wanted the viewer to see. Now, if you look at the before and the after, my capture on the left definitely doesn't draw the viewer's attention to that, but the editing in terms of how I process it, again, allows them to see what I was seeing, what I was kind of focusing in on. All right, so again, that's just an example of that. Uh, Acadia National Park in Maine. This is the before image. Okay, and that's the after. And when you look at the before and the after, I'm uh, very specifically trying to lead the viewer in a certain direction. I'm trying to get them, I'm trying to lead the eye from the foreground so to, again, emphasize a sense of depth. I'm trying to emphasize the rhythm between the sky and the foreground, between the sky and the rocks. And again, that's uh, what makes, what I'm trying to force the viewer to see what, what it is that I'm seeing. And again, this is all done in Lightroom. This is the before image, right? And that's the after. So you can see not only is it a change in tonalities, but also a change in color or uh, uh, removal of color. All right, that's the before and that's the after. Um, I like to use a lot of dodging and burning, and that's something that we're going to show that I'm going to show you in Lightroom because I think that that helps uh, to lead the eye to certain areas. And dodging and burning is one of the things that's been done since photography was started, and it's uh, it's still a, a great, great way to sort of bring uh, nice local adjustments to an image and add that little finishing touch that lots of times uh, make the difference between. Uh, an image that works and an image that works really well. That's the before image, that's in the Adirondacks. And that's, and that's after. All right, and there's your comparison. So bringing in the foreground so that it's much more obvious, so that it's much more, uh, the details are there to kind of uh, lead the eye towards that, and then that in, t in turn creates a sense of depth from foreground to background. And I'm always looking to create uh, dimension in images, especially in the kind of work that I do, which is nature and landscapes. And even though that's what I'm going to be showing, all these concepts apply to any kind of photography. So regardless of whether you're doing portraits or uh, wildlife or architecture, light is light, uh, uh, composition is composition, view leading the eye is leading the eye regardless of what you do. So. Hopefully, these, all of these will apply. Uh, that's Nova Scotia, Cape Breton Island. All right, that's the, the after. And so that, there's, your, um, there's your before and after. Again, removal of color because I was really looking more in terms of the shapes and the tonalities and the movement in the sky especially. This is a really long exposure, maybe four minutes or so, roughly. <laughs> Hudson Valley, hometown, home for me. All right, that's the after. There's your before and after. So not everything is going to be a drastic change. There's a lot of subtleties involved. Uh, it's not uh, a heavy-handed approach that I like. I like to use a very light approach that uh, emphasizes the details, not only details in terms of high-frequency detail, but details in terms of the things that the eye is going to see and appreciate. So it's not always drastic changes, uh, but very subtle changes. You'd be, you'd be surprised at how the viewer picks that up and how they react to that. 
uh, Cades Cove in the Smoky Mountains. This is the, the raw file. And the processed file right before and after. So the difference, biggest difference there really is the foreground in terms of lightening up the foreground so that it creates a much, cre creates much more depth again and um, I think opens up the scene somewhat. That's the before. This is uh, Eagle Lake in Acadia National Park. That's the after. All right, so that's the before and the after. So again, what I'm trying to get you to see is, is how I'm approaching it from the beginning to finish the image. So when I shot the original, I knew that the rocks and the water and the reflections were the key thing. And so the color wasn't a factor, and that's the first thing that I got rid of. Or in my mind, you could say, well, I, I thought that it would be a black and white from, you know, to start. Uh, but that's, what I, that's how I'm trying to lead the eye. And so if I know that beforehand, when I sit down in the computer, uh, it becomes much more, um, I wouldn't say it's easier, but it becomes more intuitive. Anybody want to guess what bridge that is? That's right. And that's the after. A few more. That's Bubble Lake and Acadia National Bubble Pond and Acadia National Park. All right, and again, the before and the after. So if you look carefully, a lot of dodging and burning between what's highlighted in the foreground, what's highlighted in the background. The opposite side of the forest is brought out so that it complements both sides of the scene. More contrast in the rocks underneath the water in the foreground. That's why I used the polarizer to begin with so that I could see into the water. So I need to make that stand out like it stood out to my eyes when I was there. And one more, this is um, the cat scales. And, and this image is interesting because I only wanted to keep this part of the image. Uh, I knew that from the get-go because that's the part that I focused on and I was too far away to, to uh, too far away to basically capture that. But that's what I wanted to keep. So that's a, that's a basic crop, top and bottom. Uh, Mount Beacon, yeah, which is about, f uh, that's probably, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 miles away from that spot. So a 200 millimeter lens on a tripod, you know, I, I basically got the area that I wanted. All right, that's your before and the after. Any questions so far up to now on anything that I've shown or talked about or? All right, so, so th those are some examples of images that I've processed and you can see the before and the after. Having said that and with that mindset, you know, now I wanted to jump into Lightroom and so work on a, take a couple of images as exa exa examples and lead you from the beginning to the end. Uh, I'm gonna do the first, I'll well, see how many, how, uh, how many I get through, but um, I'll start off kind of slow on the first one. How many people here um, use Lightroom already? Or, um, okay, great, good show of hands. This is Lightroom 5.3. So like Dave said originally, I have a computer back home that I don't upgrade very often. I keep it um, stable because everything works. This computer is the guinea pig. It gets everything brand new. So this is the 5.3 RC that was released uh, uh, a couple of days ago, whatever. But it seems to be working fine. Uh, mostly new camera uh, updates and some bug fixes. So, uh, but I haven't seen anything so far. Um, I had one little issue where one of the windows wouldn't close on me, and so I had to I had to quit and restart again. But otherwise, it seems okay. So, if uh, I will stop at the in a few spots for questions about some of the stuff in Lightroom, if I go over something or I sort of glance over something, you don't um, not quite sure about the tool or whatever, then just sort of keep that in your in your in your head until I um, ask for questions. All right. So the first image I want to work on and this is, is uh, this one here. This is Rocky Mountain National Park. 
in Colorado, and that's my final version. I like to use snapshots in the develop module, so I'm going to hit D for develop. I like snapshots for keeping track of different stages when I'm developing an image. Uh, an easy way to make a snapshot if you're working on an image is to hit Command N, as in uh, New, and that creates a new snapshot. Even if you just hit Command N and then hit the, and just hit Enter, uh, it gives it a date and a time, and you can just hit Create. I usually like to name them because I kind of go in stages, like you know, uh, version one, version two, version three, that kind of thing. If I'm going along in steps, I like to use snapshots when I come to a fork in the road, for example meaning I've gotten to a spot in my processing where I'm not sure which way I want to go. Uh, there are two directions that I might want to take the image in. And so I make, the, I make a snapshot there and then go down one road, so to speak. And if I find that I'm not liking that, then I'll back up and go down the other way. Um, if I go down one road, say, a metaphorical road, and I get to a spot where I'm happy with it, then I can either make a snapshot there or I might make a virtual copy at that point and leave it in that stage and then come back to the original uh, back to before I started making changes. Everybody understand that? So um, if I'm not sure, let's say for example, I have an image that um, I'm not sure whether I want the background to be light or dark. You know, I want a dark background in one image, a lighter one in, in another image, or dark sky, light sky. So I might make a snapshot at that point before I start to work with the sky, and then I'll start to darken the sky, right? And if, if I'm darkening the sky, and I find that I don't like it too, too much, I can always come back. If I do like it, but I want to see what the light sky version looks like, then I'll either make a snapshot and call it dark sky, or if I want to be able to see both images side by side, I'll make a virtual copy. That, in effect, then becomes my dark sky version. Then I'll come back to the first image, right, and then make it a light sky. And now I have two images that I can look at side by side, one with a dark sky, one with a light sky. All right, so I, in this case, I only have two, uh, two snapshots, one called final, one called original, <laughs> um, because I just made that for the purposes of the class here. So, so this is my original image, the way it was imported from, uh, as a raw file. Everything is zeroed out in Lightroom. I don't have anything turned on. Um, if you ever want to get to zero out your image, there's a preset that comes with Lightroom called uh, zeroed right here. Uh, that's in the Lightroom general presets, and that basically sets everything back to zero in case you sort of want to start from scratch, as it were. So let's start from the zero version here. Um, this particular image, in terms of the scene, again, when I mean that workflow starts in the field, I know what sort of the, 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 the image looked like. Definitely wasn't washed out. The sky wasn't washed out, and the foreground, the trees weren't as dark as they are here. In my capture, when I made the image, my histogram looks pretty good. I'm not clipping anything except a tiny bit amount in the shadows. You can see that little blue there. So if I hover over the histogram here in the shadows, actually if I click on this, it keeps it on so you can see down here, this little blue, these little blue areas here, what's clipping. But otherwise I didn't clip, and um, this is one exposure. I tend to um, uh, challenge myself with one exposures. I don't know why, maybe it's because I'm um, usually sort of hiking long ways to get to these places, and I'm continuing on my trail, and I don't want to stop and spend time doing HDRs and all that. <laughs> Nonetheless, having said that, when I took the image, I checked the histogram, and I noticed that I had basically had captured all the tones. When I looked at the back of the histogram, it didn't look anything like what the image, the final version is going to look like, or what it looked like to my eye, but I knew that the histogram, the, 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 all of the t tonalities were captured. And it's one of the things that I tell students on workshops is that the LCD preview really isn't that useful. What's useful is A, the composition through the viewfinder, and B, that you've captured on your histogram all the tones. If you have, then you have all the raw information that you need then when you get back into Lightroom to work with. Okay? So first thing I'm going to do here, usually the way I start is with the basic panel. A uh, couple uh, quick keyboard shortcuts, command or control on the PC, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, opens up each panel. So the the command one is the basic panel, command two is the tone curve, three is the HSL. So I kind of use these to kind of quickly get through each of the panels. I also have them in solo mode, which means that only one panel opens at a time. The way to uh, activate that is by option, and then you click on this little triangle here. So when I click now, you see that the little triangle is a solid white, and I can actually have several of them open at one time. If you put it into solo mode, which is the way I prefer, 
like that, then only one can be open at a time, so it kind of keeps the window a little more manageable, so to speak. Uh, option or alt, and then click on the little triangle here. All right, so the basic panel uh, is divided into kind of three sections. You have your white balance section, you have your basic tonal adjustments, and then you have uh, vibrance and clarity. I kind of think of this area here as an area to sort of, uh, I don't want to call, I don't want to use the word fix, but sort of uh, adjust for under or overexposure, as it were. So let's start with the white balance. Again, images like this in sunrise or sunset, the white balance is going to be somewhat, if not totally subjective, because we're not working with uh, neutral light or um, you, you're gonna, it's going to be hard to find an area in the image that has neutral light because the, the light itself is going to be warm. So I tend to kind of go for something that just looks visually appealing. Now, it's hard for me to set white balance now because the image looks so washed out. So before I set white balance, even though I usually do that first, I'm going to set, get my tonality, look, tonality, tonalities. Yes, thank you. Uh, looking just right. So um, first thing is I'm going to pull down the highlights here and highlights I use again just for that to pull down highlights that are really bright. Uh, it does recover some blown highlights but in this case I don't have any blown highlights really so so that's a that's a nice uh, plus there. All right pull down highlights and the next step really is to boost my shadows and once I do those two things now the image starts to look like the way it's supposed to look, like the way um, I wanted to capture it. Okay, so I pulled on highlights and I boosted shadows. I haven't done anything to my exposure yet because the exposure sets the overall brightness or darkness of the image. And because I had such extreme dynamic range in this image, I wasn't sure what the brightness was until now because now I can actually see my midtones, as it were. Okay, so. And even though the numbers that are here, I use them as a reference, I look at what the numbers are, but lots of times I just move the sliders. I'm not really paying attention to the numbers too much. I want to see what it does to the image. So I'm using my eyes. That's the most important thing, uh, really, when you're doing this. Use your eyes. Let your eyes be the judge of what looks right or not to you. Okay. Once I have that, then I might come back to my exposure. I might drop it just a bit because I want to get a little more richness in the sky and also in these shadows here, especially this mountain in the distance in the background. So I've dropped it down point minus, uh, minus point two, two tenths of a stop. Right now I can come back to my white balance and decide if it's where I want it to be. Um, if I boost the white balance a bit, okay, start, sky starts to get a little warmer, but as I keep going, I start to lose this blue in the, back, in the, in the opening in the sky, and I know for sure that that blue needs to be a nice rich blue, so I can't go too warm, because if I do that, it'll lose that. And I know that I want to keep that balance of blue, of coolness and warmness. And that's one of the, one of the, um, one of the gauges that I use when I'm, when I'm setting white balance in landscapes is to find that balance between coolness and warmness. Okay, it's not so much about what's neutral, but where does it feel too warm, okay, sort of like here, and where does it feel too cool here, all right, where I've lost the warmness and the richness in the parts of the sky that are getting the light. So around 5,500 here. And I also know that uh, I remember very uh, specifically that these mountains here, which are in shadow, had a slight bit of a magenta cast to them, just a bit. And so I came in here and just boosted this tint here, magenta, to about plus 5 or plus 6. And that's a very subtle change there, but I can definitely see the change in here, uh, especially when I make a print. All right, but that's a very subtle thing. If that's something that you, you, know, you, you sort of know you're looking for. But otherwise, the white balance here is a critical thing in terms of keeping, right here is what I'm talking about, this area between coolness and warmness. I want to keep that balance. And I also don't want the reds to go too red and become kind of yellowy. All right, then I'm going to boost the contrast just a little bit. This image in general has a lot of dynamic range already, so I'm not looking for a very high contrast image. I'm looking for something that has a little more subtlety to it, given that it's already got very bright areas and very dark areas. I don't need to boost the contrast all that much. If I want to increase contrast in certain areas, then I'll go back and do that with a local adjustment. Okay, so again, my vision for the image is that 
it should have more of a it should have a sunrise feel to it okay the, the, but it shouldn't be overly contrasty where it feels hard it should have a softer feel to it so that's why I'm only going to boost contrast about six or seven here um, just to help with uh, with with just adding a little bit of of texture to it and I also know that I can get that from clarity so I'm going to come to that in a minute below here. Whites sets my white point alright so if I hold down you know the option key and adjust the whites I can actually see where white is clipping and this again only assumes that you have an area of the image that you want to be pure white and in this case I don't because you can see that doesn't work too well. Uh, technically speaking, yes, I'm expanding the dynamic range, but that doesn't look the way I want it to look. So whites, uh, I would say, I'm, I'm just eyeballing that. I'm going on what looks right to me. And that's about five, okay? Um, same thing with blacks. If I hold on the option key and I pull the blacks down, areas that are in yellow mean that uh, I'm clipping blacks in one of the channels. Uh, most likely the blue channel. When it goes black, it means that I'm clipping blacks in all three uh, channels, red, green, and blue. So I'm just going to come down just a bit. And one of the things that you can work with that's really powerful is this interplay between the blacks and the shadows because when you boost the shadows and pull the blacks down, so when I, mean, when I say pull blacks down, I'm adding more black to the image, and then I push the shadows up, I'm creating a nice curve that helps to give me richer blacks but not get my lower midtones too dark. Okay, and so I usually find that when I boost shadows, I usually have to uh, also add a little more black to the image. So that's my basic panel here so far. And I always like to start kind of globally, thinking about how the image is going to look globally and then move to local adjustments and then usually I come back for what I call the finishing, which is okay, now that I'm towards the end, are there any changes that I can make again in this basic panel? But I don't try to get too bogged down here because again, I'm not trying to perfect every single number here. I'm trying to get the image to, to correlate to what I have in my mind in terms of the look and the feel of the image. And so I'm going to um, let myself sort of play with that a little bit. So I don't need to lock down these numbers just yet. Uh, and I may not lock down these numbers for a while. I may not lock them down until after I print or after I've had it sitting in my catalog for a few years. I mean, it all depends. But it doesn't mean that I don't have a vision to start with the image now and that I'm, I'm, that I'm, trying, that I'm not trying to get as close as I can to that, to that kind of idea in my head, okay. All right, this next section here, uh, clarity, vibrance, and saturation. Clarity is sort of like a micro contrast. And one thing that clarity does in addition to adding micro contrast is that it also brightens up darker parts of the image. It makes them actually brighter. So you can see how, never mind the sky, but you can see how it's brightening the foreground. So you have to be careful with that because it does change tonality a little bit. And I like to be very subtle with the clarity as well. In this case, I'm probably going to go, that's zero, I'm probably going to go around 25 or so, around there. If I want more clarity in a certain part of the image, again, I can do that later with uh, one of the local adjustments. So these are, lo these are uh, global adjustments, and I'm only going to go as far as, as long as the whole image, uh, or, or I should say, I'm only going to go as far as there's no part of the image that gets hurt or that um, degrades by one of the uh, global adjustments. Okay, so if I know that I want a certain part of the image to have more clarity, but another part's going to suffer, then I'll stop where I get to, um, to the best thing that I can do with the, with the global clarity, and then I'll go back and I'll use a local adjustment. Vibrance is also one of those great uh, tools in, in Lightroom, which basically it will saturate colors that are sort of desaturated to begin with. In other words, it kind of analyzes the colors in your image, and then if there's an area that has less color, it will add a little more color to that area uh, based on colors around it. And that's different from the way saturation works, because saturation is uh, pretty much a, uh, a blanket saturation of all colors equally. Uh, vibrance is also... Uh, sensitive to skin tones. So if you're doing anything with people, um, it's a great uh, tool for that because it kind of is sensitive to that and so y you can make uh, colors with people and them kind of pop but it doesn't make your uh, subjects get their glowing, like their skin is glowing. So that's kind of nice. 
I'm going to take saturation up to about around there, 27 or 28 or so. All right. So that's saturation at zero. Vibrance, I'm sorry. Vibrance to around 30, okay? And I may add a little bit of saturation. Usually I like to add just a bit. Again, we're talking about a raw file that has no processing done to it whatsoever. Uh, so you want to add some boost in the color uh, with a combination of the vibrance and or the saturation. That's the before and the after, all right? And uh, that's the backslash key. Backslash. The other nice thing about the, the backslash key or the before and after uh, pr uh, feature in Lightroom is that you can change what your before is. So before doesn't always have to be when you start. You can actually say, okay, I want to be able to compare it to where I'm at this particular point right now. And the way you do that is up here in settings, you can say copy after settings to before. So these are my after settings right now. These are my before settings. If I say copy after settings to before, Right? Then now when I hit my backslash key, my before looks just like my after because I've now set that to where I'm at right now in the image. And now I can start to make changes and compare to this particular stage and not when I first started. All right, so you can, that's kind of a nice feature you can change. So I'm pretty much done here in the basic panel. Um, sometimes I may or may not use the tone curve, again, depending on, on what I want to achieve in the image. In this case, I'm pretty happy with the, with the contrast. I'm pretty happy with the, with the tonal range. Again, I don't want an image that is completely expanded from bright to dark. I want it to be a little more subtle. And so I'm actually not going to use, didn't use a tone curve in this image at all. Uh, and whatever little contrast I added, I added here in the uh, basic contrast adjustment. OK, there'll be some other images later where we'll work with the tone curve. And I'll actually show you how to put points on it and adjust the tonality that way. Uh, same thing with the H uh, HSL controls here. For this particular image, I didn't do anything with the HSL. Um, sometimes I will use this to darken skies. So I use it as sort of a virtual uh, polarizer, if you will, because you have control over each color, including blue. So uh, sometimes that's useful. In this case, I don't have a, a need for that. If, let's say, you were, uh, let's say I wanted to control some of these highlights here, I might say, okay, these highlights are based on a color. And so I could drag one of these sliders, or easier, I could use the target adjustment tool because I'm not really sure what color this is. And it also may be a combination of two colors. And when I select the target adjustment tool here, every, almost every panel has this little tool here. As I, before I'm even clicking, as I drag over the image, you can see on this side, it kind of chooses what color or tells you what color is there. In this case, it's only showing one color, but sometimes it'll show you two colors when you start dragging especially. But anyway, in this case, I could click here and drag. Actually, there you go. So you see it's pulling down two colors at the same time. And not only at the same time, but it's pulling them in the ratio that they are found on the image, which is really nice, because it'd be hard to do that. All right, so you could do something like that if you wanted. And you can see how I'm just darkening that part of the image based on color All right, as an option. And if you ever want to reset any of the panels, uh, hold on the Option key, and you see that the panel gives you this reset, and you can just click on that and reset. In this case, I'm not going to use that, but that's an option for you, again, to be able to lighten or darken parts of an image based on color. All right, I'm going to jump down to Detail. The next panel down is Split Toning. No Split Toning here either. The Detail panel, again, is your Sharpening, another word for Sharpening. Uh, every image that you bring into Lightroom has to be sharpened to a certain degree uh, to make up for the aliasing filter in most uh, DSLRs, which kind of blurs and makes the image a little softer. Okay, so a lot of people are confused about this, I find. So let me see if I can sort of explain it uh, as easily and simply as possible. In the sharpening, the reason why, by the way, sharpening and noise reduction is together is because they're kind of the flip side of the same thing. Sharpening sharpens and noise reduction kind of blurs to get rid of noise. Now, in any of the Lightroom modules, if you hit the I key, that brings up the what's called the information panel. And so this will tell me what the settings are for this image. 
quarter of a second at f8, ISO 100. So I get a sense there of how much noise reduction I might need or not need. I usually I'll visually check to make sure that I actually do need noise reduction. But in this case, you can see that um, at ISO 100, I, I'm minimizing noise as much as possible. So I, I don't need to use a lot of noise reduction here. So in terms of sharpening, we have the amount slider. And this basically controls how much sharpening. And the important thing here is that make sure you're zoomed in 100% because otherwise it's very difficult to see the actual sharpening effect. So you have to kind of zoom in at 100% and it even gives you a little warning, I think, if you're not zoomed in, uh, used to anyway. So the, the amount is how much sharpening. So basically kind of uh, like a volume slider from, from 0 to 150. I usually add a little more than I need and then I back it off so that I can visually see what the sharpening is. So I'm going to say, for now, let's say like 90. Radius is the width of the sharpening effect based on the edges in your image. So if your image has a lot of edges, and that's what we're sharpening, sharpening is basically looking for individual edges and then increasing the contrast along that edge so that you get a nice sharp edge. The more edges you have, the lower you should keep this radius. So for landscapes in general, one works pretty well. If you have an image that doesn't have a lot of edges, like uh, faces, for example, people's faces, portraits, you can raise that up to 1.4, 1.5, and you eliminate sharpening things like facial features, if that's what you want, uh, if, if that's what you want to avoid. Okay, so that's what radius does. It basically looks for the edges, and the uh, more edges there are, the more it finds if you keep that radius low. Once you have your amount and radius set, the detail slider uh, basically acts as either suppressing halos, which is something that you get when you over sharpen, and or it will enhance the, the edges that you've defined with the radius slider. So again, if you have a, li a lot of fre high frequency detail, I like to push the detail slider up. And if you look over here, or if I hold down the option key, you can see here that with a detail slider <coughs> down towards the left, which is the low numbers, like 20, 25, that's what it looks like. But if I push the slider to the right, you start to pick up more edges and the sharpening gets a little more refined. All right, and so that's what, in general, I want. I want to be able to pick out more the edges, especially in the trees here and also back here uh, on this mountain. So I, usually around 75. When you bring it down around 25, it's actually act, acting like, a, again, like I mentioned, a halo suppressor, and that tends to soften, soften some edges. And then the masking slider is one of my favorite sliders because what that does is that it will automatically mask out parts of an image based on smoothness. And Lightroom assumes that an area that's very, very smooth is an area that doesn't want to be sharpened. So skies, for example, are smooth. Uh, water, if it's very smooth water, not water that has uh, texture to it, but let's say very, very calm, smooth water, you don't need to sharpen anything. And if anything, you're going to sharpen noise in the image because there's nothing there to sharpen. And the way this works, which is the brilliant part about it, is that you hold down the Option key. You should always hold on the option key when using the masking tool. And then as you hold on the option key and drag the masking slider, it will automatically mask out, again, areas that it detects are smooth. And so you can see the areas that are turning black are the areas that are being masked or protected from the sharpening effect. Then you see the sky going first because that's, what's the, that's what the smoothest part is, aside from the lines and the clouds and whatnot. So this is one of those things where it works very, very well, but you have to be careful that you don't overdo it because then what happens is you start to soften parts of the image that you do want to sharpen. So you kind of have to have a, keep a balance. Uh, and for me here, I would say somewhere around 20. I don't want to encroach too much in the trees. You can see the bottom right, I'm getting a lot of black in the trees and also in the mountain in the background, I'm starting to get some black on the surface of the mountain. And I don't want that to happen too much. I want to keep some of that. Uh, texture there. So around 18 or 20 is good, but I've protected a lot of areas up here in the sky from being sharpened. And that to me has a couple of really, really good advantages. One is, of course, you're not introducing things, artifacts into the image that don't need to be sharpened, like noise. Uh, the other thing, though, is that from a visual standpoint, from a, even from a compositional standpoint, we are drawn to things that are sharper. 
just like we're drawn to areas that have higher contrast, things that are brighter versus darker, we're drawn to things that are sharper versus things that are softer. And that's a way, another way to lead the eye. So if you're able to selectively sharpen, then you're able to much more easily, uh, again, draw attention to things in your image. And if you need more control uh, than what the masking tool gives you, then you can certainly use a local adjustment to sharpen things in Lightroom. And, and that would be typical, for example, if you just wanted to sharpen a person's eyes and not the rest of the picture, I wouldn't use the masking tool at all. I would, I would use uh, a local adjustment, a brush tool to sharpen the eyes. All right, and I'll show you the local adjustments when we get to that stage. Finally, for noise reduction, on something like this, I'm going to check here in the shadows. That's usually where you see noise. But shadows that have a lot of smooth areas. So my shadows here don't have smooth areas. They have lots of texture again. So I don't want to blur those too much. So if I, I see some noise in there, I'm just going to use a very simple noise reduction here, uh, maybe 12 in the luminance and another 10 in the color. And I can see that that took out some noise here that I had a minute ago. Every panel has a little, a little tiny switch here in the bottom left. And if you toggle that switch, it turns off that particular panel. So you can see uh, the, you know, what, what it's doing. Remember that when you sharpen an image, you are going to inherently sharpen some of the noise. And so the noise reduction helps to balance that out. So you can see when I untoggle this, you don't see much change in terms of noise. You just see it getting a little bit sharper. And so that's, that's really what you want. You want the image to get sharper without creating more noise. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to what you're talking about? Uh, remind me, I'll answer that when we get to the question section. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so then the last two areas here are, uh, the last three areas are lens correction effects and, and camera calibration. I left lens correction unchecked purposely, even though I have to admit that when I import my images into Lightroom, there is a way to apply a preset to all the images that get imported if you want. Um, and I always have that checked in a preset because when I bring them in, I just want that to be on automatically so I don't have to deal with that. Everything else I pretty much leave off, but I have that checked so that it gets corrected as it's imported. I left it unchecked here, though, for the simple reason that this probably has one of the biggest performance hits on Lightroom when you're editing images. And so I find that when this is unchecked, Lightroom is a lot more responsive, and I just leave that to the end so I can turn it back on. And since I'm uh, speaking to all of you and everyone else is going to be watching later on. I didn't want the, the uh, Lightroom to get bogged down on me. So is that a default setting? It isn't a default setting, no. It's, 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 it's off by default. When you turn it on, so let me show you what it does when you turn it on, is it corrects for distortion, it corrects for light fall off on the edges, it automatically detects your camera, body, and lens. So it's really nice and you can see it has a nice it makes a nice difference there in terms of the corners especially. But sometimes it slows the program down and so in this case I, I wanted to leave it off until I got to this point. But normally for me I turn it on when I import the images just so that it's on because before I get into developing any images I'm usually previewing them. I'm usually going through my library and making ratings and adjustments and I like to see it at least with that turned on so that um, things that are defects in the lens aren't going to affect my decision process in terms of rating images or what have you. All right, um, I didn't do any effects here uh, in terms of uh, vignettes or anything like that. So the last step here is to do some local adjustments and in this image I did. So what am I trying to, what am I trying to do here? Well, two things. The key for me for this image to work is A, I need to have more detail in the shadows because there was definitely a sense of walking through this forest so that I could see where I was standing and how I was kind of navigating through these pine trees, but I also had this amazing sky and the mountains in the distance. And so I don't want to lose that sense. So what I'm going to do is number one, in order for me to make the foreground brighter, I need to control the sky. Otherwise, I'm going to be fighting one with the other. I'm going to brighten the foreground and then the sky is going to get brighter if I'm using a global adjustment, let's say like exposure or whatnot. So I'm going to, up here in the, at the very top, I don't know why they didn't put these at the bottom because they should come at the bottom, but they're above the basic panel, are your basic local adjustments. I like to use the keyboard shortcut keys. Uh, M is for graduated filter. 
Don't ask me why, that's the letter that they selected. Um, I guess G because G is for grid, so you can't use G for graduated filter. Uh, the graduated filter is one of my favorite tools in Lightroom. Basically, when you turn that, when you select the graduated filter or hit the M key, you can click and drag out a filter like so. And this filter now always acts on a straight line, and you have three lines here. The center line defines the center of the effect or the center of the filter because this is basically sort of emulating a graduated filter and then the two lines top and bottom define the area of transition so in other words the best way to see that is now when you create any of these use any of these filters you get this huge control panel over here that allows you to select what that filter is going to be what, what, what's, what's it going to change and the powerful thing is that you have multiple options for each filter. It just doesn't have to be exposure or contrast or highlights. It can be any number of those things. So let me just use exposure as an example in a exaggerated way so that you can see how the tool works or how the filter works. If I do that, then you see it's darkening the top and not affecting the bottom. So the filter it works opposite direction you drag it in. But you can always flip it around. So if I hover my mouse away from the circle pin here, they call this a pin in Lightroom. Okay, I can change the filter. Actually, I'm sorry, that was the wrong thing. I actually dra dra dragged out a new one. There we go. So I can flip this filter around like so. So you don't have to drag it correctly the first time out. The second thing is the distance between these two lines defines the transition. So if I make these two lines very close to each other, then that means that the transition is very abrupt, like a hard-edged filter or a hard-edged graduated filter. And opposite, if I drag these out, it makes it very soft, uh, makes the feathering very soft. So that has a lot of different possibilities and uses. So in this case, what I want to do is I don't want to make a hard edge. Why? Because I don't have a hard, straight line in the image that I want to adjust. I have uh, basically along this line here, the mountains with some trees sticking in, and even the mountain is not perfectly straight. Now, there are several ways to do this. I'm showing one way to do it, okay? One way to darken the sky. So I do something like this, and I'm gonna probably make my exposure, you know, around there somewhere. I'm also gonna boost the clarity, because I also like to use clarity in clouds just to bring a little more texture and detail to the clouds. If you're into the HDR look, you can start to get that look as well, because clarity basically really enhances micro contrast. But I really, again, I'm after a subtle effect. By doing this now, I've darkened the sky a little bit more. Okay? And then I can do a couple things. I can drag out another filter from the bottom up, like so, make a very smooth transition here. I'm going to zero this out. And I'm just going to, all I'm doing is I put, if I set this to zero, and I put my cursor in here like that. Until that turns white, I can use my arrow keys. And sometimes I like to do that because I can just kind of press the arrow keys up and down to see what the effect is. All right. So again, this filter has a, a little switch here. If I turn the switch off, that's without it. That's with it. There's two graduated filters, one affecting the sky and one affecting just the bottom right-hand portion of the image. If you want to, um, another quick keyboard shortcut is if you have a filter selected but you don't want to see the pins, you hit the H, uh, the H key and that hides the pins even if the filter is selected. If you hit the H key again, then you see the, the pins are shown. So sometimes I don't want to see the pins, I just want to see the picture, but I'm still working within that filter. So just another quick little shortcut to allow you to show those, those little pins, okay? So that's the, that's the, the graduated filter. And you can see it's got a lot, of a lot of power here because it controls all these different settings. So you can do everything from sharpness, noise, defringe, saturation, contrast, shadows, brightness, etc. All right. The limitation with the graduated filter is that it only works along a straight line. <coughs> so if you need something that's a little more varied, then you could use one of the other filters, uh, like the well, the, the radio filter, which is a new filter now in Lightroom. So basically, they took the linear filter of the graduated and made, and made it radio. I'm not going to use it here. I'll use it in another image, but that's this next tool here. And then you have the brush filter, which allows you to brush <coughs> in areas of the image. Okay? 
All right, so that's, that's, that's pretty much it with this image in terms of the steps that I took. At this point, I would probably uh, print, print it out. Me, myself, that's the next step that I would do. I print out my images, um, and then I take a look and see if I need to make some adjustment. Not based on what it, how it compares to my monitor, but based on once I have it on a piece of paper to see if that really, in fact, is the image that I want. The final piece for me is the print. But that's, again, that's, I, I, that's just me. If you're not printing and you're just, you know, you're just um, sharing online, well, you know, then you would kind of have to judge and see if that you're finished with that image or not. And, at that, and then at this point, you can export it. Uh, the question about exporting and sharpening, that's just, uh, that's just an extra sharpening that Lightroom gives you so that when you export images for the web, you can add a little extra sharpening to them because you're making them smaller typically, and so you want to keep them a little sharper. So and they, they, they give you very limited options for that too. I think it's low, medium, and high. But that's only in the export. Okay? I would only sharpen this image further if A, I was exporting it, or B, I was printing it. When you print, you have to do print sharpening. That's in the, in the, last, uh, in the last workshop. All right, this is, and I'm going to do a little more black and white and some more local adjustments. And I'm not going to go through every single tool now because I've covered some of those. So I'm going to show you how I use the tools for this particular image. So D for develop, that takes you into the develop module. All right, and I'm going back to my snapshots, and I'm going to open up my original. All right, so you can see what it looked like when I imported it. All right, so that's the original file. Okay, so let me go in here now and make some basic adjustments. So first thing I'm going to do is white balance. Here I can actually see the image. I can see the colors. I can see the color cast if it has one. So I can definitely start with white balance. I'm just going to make this a little warmer, again, by eye. And again, always trying to keep in mind the balance between coolness and warmness. I know that the rocks were warm because they had warm light on them. But I also know that the clouds were grayish and were not, uh, were not too warm. They were sort of neutral. So if I go too far with this, see the clouds start to get a little bit too warm. And I know for a fact, at least for me, that that wasn't what it looked like. And that's not what I want. Okay, if you, that's what you want, that's a different story. That's perfectly fine. That's where the vision part comes in. I'm trying to maintain uh, a balance between the coolness and the warmness. So I would say around here works pretty well for me, around 55 or 5600. Okay. I'm going to add some contrast here. 10, my exposure, again, looks pretty much okay. Exposure is the overall brightness or darkness of the image, so kind of like the exposure in your camera. And again, looking at my histogram, what do I have here? I have highlights are good. I'm not clipping anything in the highlights. In the shadows, I have a little bit of a loss of detail in the bottom part of the image. Again, that's fine. Why? Because that part of the image is really dark. It's kind of like in the crack of the rock there. And so that's black. I don't need to see anything there. I actually like the shape that that black area creates. That's one of the reasons why I made the image. So it's a, a display between the rocks and the shadows that create negative space and create more shapes that then balance with the sky. So these are the things that I'm thinking about and looking at when I'm composing the image. That's what I take with me when I go into Lightroom to try to emphasize that. So it's not about, oh, I've got to recover shadow. No, I have to work with what I have there to make the composition stronger. And if that means that the shadows need to be stronger, then they can clip. That's OK. OK. Again, those particular shadows, not all shadows in general. OK, I'm going to pull the highlights down a bit again, not because I'm clipping anything, but because the highlights helps to control the brightest parts of the image. So when you pull the highlight slider down, uh, and again, I'm pulling it to the left. That means that I'm reducing highlights. You're extracting a little more tonality in the brightest parts of the image. Okay, that's why I like to use a highlight slider, even though I'm not clipping anything. I'm just saying the brightest parts of the image, I want to get a little more tonality in there. So you can see, if I push the highlights, okay, you see how the clouds sort of get washed out. If I pull the highlight slider down, I'm getting more richness in the brightest parts of the clouds. And we all know that there's a lot of tonal information in the in highlights in clouds. Okay, I'm going to boost the shadows a bit. Not for this area here, but I'm now looking at other areas of the image. And I know that even if I go too far with the shadows, I can always use my black slider to get these areas rich and black again the way I want them to be. 
So I'm going to boost shadows just a bit. Around there. Uh, my whites are okay. If I hold the Option or the Alt key down, uh, I can use the white slider here. But again, I'm pretty happy with where the whites are. I know my histogram is pretty well expanded. So that's, that's kind of what I'm looking for. All right, this is another reason why it's important to make sure your monitor is calibrated so you can actually visually tell if your whites are where they should be. Because if your monitor is not calibrated, then you might not be able to tell. Okay, so I'm going to pull blacks down just a bit. All right, and I'm doing that because I want to get a little bit richer here in these blacks. Okay, so I'm down around minus five in the blacks. I'm going to add some clarity again. That just helps to bring in some contrast. At this point with this image, when I was working on this image around here, around this area when I was kind of, okay, I had it kind of in the ballpark, I knew that I was probably going to convert it to black and white. And the reason for that is because, again, it's the shapes and the lines that caught my attention from the very beginning, from the moment that I set up my tripod. And so adjusting it in color was just sort of an exercise. You can go to black and white from, right from the get-go. I like to do at least the basic in color because the way you adjust the color will, will affect the way your uh, black and white image looks based on how you adjust the tonal sliders, and I'll show you that in a minute. I'm going to add some vibrance here just to bring that out, but again, I know I'm going to go to black and white, so, uh, black and white, so this is probably a mood point. So if I'm going to go to black and white, the easy way to do that in, in Lightroom is to hit the V key. Now, I mentioned before about a snapshot, and okay, let's say I don't like the way the black and white turns out or I decide that I want to work some more with the color, I'll hit Command N and I'll say uh, color version one, hit create, and now I have a color version at this point in time right now. I hit the V key, V for black and white, and <laughs> V for black and white, you just got to memorize that and you're all set with Lightroom. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a slide, there's a, uh, I like to use the keyboard shortcuts because I, it just gets really fast for me to be able to do that. But you can also click on black and white here. Uh, and the reason why you want to do black and white and not just desaturate the image is because if you desaturate, then you don't get access to the black and white controls, which I'll show you in a minute and they're very key. All right, so at this point, I went down to the tone curve and now that I have it in black and white, there's a couple of things I'd like to do. A, I would like to darken the sky because darkening the sky is going to make the clouds a lot richer. B, I would like to add, a, I would like to get a little more mid-tone, uh, a little more of the mid-tones in the image to, to be a little brighter because I love nice rich mid-tones in a black and white image, especially one that has a lot of, a lot of highlights and shadows because that just kind of helps that transition and makes a print that looks really luminous and nice. So one way I could do that is in the tonal slider here, <coughs> um, I could just go in and use one of the standard uh, uh, presets here, so this would be medium contrast, that strong contrast, but that's not really what I want. It's just making the image more contrasty and darkening the areas that I actually don't want to darken. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a couple of points. Now I can set these on the point curve or I can use the target adjustment tool, for example. So if I use the target adjustment tool, I don't want the rocks to get much brighter, so if I click on these rocks, like that, it makes a point. It sets a point there. And I can also click down here in the shadows, in the deep shadows, and make another point. Now, I kind of know by eye already that that's where these points should be, but I just kind of find an area here. What this means is that I don't want these two areas to move very much. I, I kind of want to lock those areas down. But I do want to increase my midtone. So if I make a point in between here, now I can increase the midtones or decrease the midtones. And as I increase these lower midtones, you can see that the rocks aren't getting much brighter and the shadows aren't getting much darker. I'm kind of localizing where I want to adjust. And I probably went too far. This was more subtle when I did it originally. It was probably around here. I'm also going to put another point here and adjust my highlights just a bit. Knowing well that I'm going to darken the sky, so that's going to make those clouds a lot more vivid in terms of tonalities. All right, so again, that's just a very sort of a nuanced way to use the point curve. If I wanted to get a little more riches in the shadow, I might want to drop this, this point down a little bit here, but you have to be careful not to lose too much shadow detail here down in the shadows. Okay, 
So let's say I'm happy with that. Let's see what that looks like before and after. I'm just going to turn this off here. That's before and that's after. So that, it's a slight adjustment um, in terms of the tonalities. And again, I'm not sure how much I want to go with that. So I'm going to keep going and then I'll come back and see how everything is working uh, as a whole. Now in the black and white uh, controls, this, these controls here are really powerful. And basically what they do is they allow you to adjust the brightness or darkness or the luminance, Lightroom calls it, uh, the luminance of an area of the image based on its color. All right, so if you have something in the color image that's red, you can adjust the brightness or the darkness of that area here based on the color red, even though we're looking at a black and white image. So a perfect example of that is the sky. I want the sky to be darker. I know that the sky is blue, right? So I don't even have to use my target adjustment tool. If I come here to the blue, and boost this up, the sky gets brighter. If I come the other way, the sky gets darker. Okay, So because the sky is blue, I'm able to adjust the brightness or darkness of it. And this applies to all of these colors here. Now, sometimes you may not have a part of the image that's a specific color. You may not be sure what the color is, in which case I'll use a target adjustment tool. So for example, if I click to turn the target adjustment tool on, and then I come to these rocks here, you see Lightroom is telling me it's orange and yellow. So if I click and drag here, this makes the rocks darker. This makes the rocks brighter. Hmm. Now, I could do this with a brush tool. I could do this with the local adjustments, but I would then be brushing in and trying to control the overlap or using a mask, whereas this way, it's limiting, limiting it to color. Anybody that has worked with Photoshop knows that we used to do that in Photoshop too with the color range tool. You could just select the color and adjust it. This is doing it for you on the fly. So you don't even have to uh, make a mask the way you do in Photoshop. All right. This back here, it's telling me that it's kind of greenish. May or may not work. You can see it's doing a little bit, but not very much. So sometimes it works better than others, depending on how pure the color is in the image. OK, now, why am I adjusting that? Well, visually, I know as I continue to process this image that one of the things I want is I still want to lighten up this area here. I'm looking at shapes and tones and colors. And there's a strong connection between the foreground and the sky. But I feel like the eye can get kind of lost in here. And it's just kind of jumping over this. So I want to open these areas up here. By open, I mean I want to make them visually interesting. And if I can't do that by color, then I'm going to probably use some kind of a local adjustment tool to do that. And that's, that's what I did, because I really couldn't get the color that I wanted. And these rocks are sort of neutral grayish anyway, so it's going to be hard to do it by color. And they're not getting any light, so there goes the orange that we used for the rocks in the foreground. Okay. So that's, this, that's, this, uh, that's the, the black and white uh, mix uh, control here for black and white images. Again, very powerful. The auto button here just basically allows Lightroom to sort of guess at what it thinks the auto adjustment would be. Let's see what that is. So if I click on auto, and it just, you know, that's what it thinks the image would look best. Obviously, I disagree. So uh, Command Z undoes that and goes back to the way it was. And this is wrong, nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I'll go in and I'll just hit auto and say, okay, where do you think, you know, what do you think it looks like? I have to be honest, I probably don't use that much anymore. I used to use it before. Everything that I talked about at the beginning of the class is the reason why. Because now when I go in, I kind of know, OK, I, these are the areas that I want to work with, the area that I want to emphasize, de-emphasize. The auto is just auto, based on what? Who knows? You know, does it really know that this is a rock and how I felt when I was there? No. <laughs> All right, so. Um, <clears throat> OK, so. The next panel down is split toning. I did use split toning in this image. However, I do not use it here. For me, split toning is one of those things that comes way at the end. It's a finishing touch that just sort of adds that extra little uh, touch finish to an image. So I, it's too early for me to do it here. I'm still doing local adjustments and figuring out exactly where the tones are going to be. So I'm going to skip over that for now. Uh, detail, again, same thing. I'm going to bring my sharpening up to around uh, 60 or so, radius, 1.0 or less. Why? Because, again, radius means that if we keep a low radius, it's going to detect the lots and lots and lots of edges. And I have lots and lots of edges in this image. So I want to leave it low. Detail, I do not want to um, 
suppress halos, which is what happens when you go to the left. I want to bring out as much detail as possible, so I'm going to go to the right to around 75. Okay, so high frequency images, typically landscapes, nature, things that have lots of texture, radius low, detail high. Okay, people's faces, women, babies, radius high, detail low. All right, that just gets the outlines and you avoid pores and things like that as a start. Okay, and then masking, of course, I want to use masking here just to mask out the sky. I'm going to hold on the Option key or the Alt key on the PC. I'm going to push the masking control up. And you can see the areas that it's masking off. So A, it's masking off the shadows in the foreground, which don't need any sharpening because we've had a loss of detail. There's no detail and no shadows. And also in the sky somewhat, which is fine. Uh, I would say even around, tw even, and you notice, even if I bring it up around 25, it's still having a hard time masking off the rocks in the foreground. Why? Because Lightroom sees that there's lots and lots of detail there. So it's doing a good job of protecting that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it around 25 or so. Noise reduction. Um, again, I'm going to go in here. I don't know if I see much noise. Maybe some noise back here in the water. Hitting the I key, I'm at ISO 400, so I'm a little bit higher than I normally shoot. I'm going to push luminance up to around, around there. All right, and that does a pretty good job of eliminating that noise, especially zoomed in at one-to-one -one like this. When I back out, that noise <laughs> really isn't going to be detectable when you make a print, especially since it's water and the water is kind of moving. It isn't. Uh, s smooth. Lens correction is probably off, yeah, because as I mentioned, I had it off. But my, uh, back to my point, your question, I don't know what camera this was, or what, I know what camera, I don't remember what lens it was, it doesn't matter. When I turn this on, it detects it. And if you look here in profile, it's telling me what lens I used. So it's actually told, it's telling me here, uh, 24 105, and if I hit the I key, there's my confirmation up here. So it looks in the metadata, reads what the lens is finds the lens in the database. One of the things that Lightroom does with updates, every time you update a new version, what are they doing? They're putting in new lenses and new camera bodies that come out for this very reason, so that now you can apply noise reduction in addition to being able to develop them in Lightroom. So that's one of the things they're constantly adding is more and more information about all the manufacturers and lenses and all that that are out there. All right. So now let's go up to the, to the, um, Graduated filter. I didn't use a graduated filter in this image. Okay, and I know that my HSL, I'm going to pull this down a bit more because the sky should be a little darker. That's really where I want it to be around there. If I select the brush tool, what I did here was I have the brushes, but I turned them off. So I'm going to turn the brushes on. All right, you see what they did. So now, what, where are the brushes and what are they doing? Well, once I hover over the image, you can see I have one, two, three pins here. This first pin is here, all right, and that's what that brush is doing. This is a dodging brush, meaning that I'm brightening those areas of the image. So I dodge this rock here, this part of the rock here, and I'm also dodging these rocks down here just to bring a little more light. So again, here is the before, and there's the after, okay? Same thing with these areas here just to make them a little brighter. Why? Again, the same the reason I mentioned before is that I want to have more continuity in the image between the foreground and the sky so that it just doesn't become this kind of dark void. The other pin is over here and that one is lightening the water a bit and also lightening the forest on the far ground, uh, in the, on the background, I'm sorry, on the far side of the image. And then the last brush is here which is a another dodging brush, okay, just to lighten up these clouds. And the reason for that is because, again, I didn't want the image to be sort of foreboding. It's not an image made after or before a big thunderstorm. This is more of a really calm, serene sunset with lots of big clouds. And so I don't want, even though I darken the sky, I don't want the clouds to get really dark. I, that's not the intent of the image to make it very heavy. So that's why I use the brush here to lighten up these clouds a bit. So. Again, you can go darker or brighter. There's no rule in terms of which way you want to go. Just because darker clouds might look more dramatic, maybe that's not the whole point of what you're trying to convey. 
I really wanted to kind of convey this beautiful rhythm here of the foreground to the sky in the background and what's in between. One other thing with the brush tool, which is really cool, is a function that Lightroom has called Auto Mask. And basically what that does is that it will automatically detect edges and protect those edges from your brush. So for example, let's say I wanted to darken the sky manually. Instead of using the uh, black and white mixer, I wanted to just darken it using a brush. Well, I could, let's make a new brush. The way you make a new brush is you just select new up here. So this way you're not, or make sure all the pins are deselected. Uh, otherwise, if you have a pin selected like this, and you start brushing again, you're brushing with the same controls as that other brush. And so if you change that brush, you're going to change everything. So for example, if this brush here is set to brighten, right? That's the one I have selected. It's set at an exposure of 0.25. If I brush here like this, it's brightening up my sky, but it's, that's the same brush as this one. That's that same brush. So now I cannot darken the sky without darkening everything else. What I need to do is I need to make a brand new brush, okay? And the way to do that is by just coming up here and saying new. Now I have a new brush independent of all the others. Now, this, the, the clouds up here have an edge. And if I wanted to brush in the sky but not have the brush spill over into the clouds, I could turn the auto mask on. So that's down here. I'm going to turn the auto mask the checkbox down here. And as I brush the sky, that little plus symbol in, the, in my mouse as long as that little plus symbol doesn't go over the edge, it will mask off the sky. And I'll show you what the mask looks like. So I'm just brushing here. As long as that little plus doesn't touch the area that I want to mask, meaning the clouds, then it's going to keep the mask to the clouds. So now watch. If I now do this, okay, and if I hover over, you can see the mask that was created automatically. Now what I meant by the plus symbol is that that little plus in the middle of the brush if I accidentally spill over into the clouds like that, it now thinks that I also want to darken that and so the mask will go beyond the edge. Now the way to revert that uh, or to undo that is, well two ways, I could do uh, Command Z, Command or Control Z. The other way though is that every brush has an eraser mode. And so if I go into eraser mode, which is right here in the uh, brush panel, if I click on eraser, that basically erases what I brushed, uh, erases what I brushed, but I can also turn on auto mask for erasing, which means that as I erase, right, as long as I don't go past the clouds, it's going to erase to the edge of the clouds and create another mask in reverse. So in other words, if I hover over again, you can see the mask there. And I missed a little spot here, so I'm going to brush here again. Okay, so I've seen some people that will do what I just did in reverse. They'll brush the sky in without the mask turned on, and then whatever spilled over, they'll go back with the eraser tool with the mask turned on and delete it. So you can go either way. I usually try to do it from the get-go in one, in one shot with the mask tool turned on, but either way works fine. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's, that's very powerful. Now, I didn't do this originally because um, versus how long this took me to do, having to mask out the sky, if I know that the sky or an area of the image is a, is a pretty solid color, then I can just use the mix control, the black and white mix control to, to darken the sky. And that's automatically going to use a mask. Why? Because the sky is blue and the clouds are white. So it's a much simpler way of, of doing that adjustment. Um, but if I didn't have that, or if, you know, for whatever reason, I couldn't do it with the mix sliders, then I would use the black and white mix sliders, and I would use the, uh, a brush. And depending on if I had a, an edge, then I could use the auto mask. Typically that happens with the sky if you have a sky and land and you want, for whatever reason, you don't want to use a graduated filter. You want to mask off the sky with a brush. You can turn the auto mask on and as long as you brush along the horizon but that little plus sign doesn't go into the horizon, into the ground, it'll create a mask along the edge. Everything that you do in Lightroom, I'll end on this, uh, there is a history panel in the develop module in Lightroom and it shows you every single adjustment you've made. Okay. So unlike Photoshop, which limits your history to a certain amount, otherwise you run out of memory, um, Lightroom keeps track of every single thing you've done to every single image in your library, uh, which is really nice, except that um, if you're not sure where you want to go back to, then you're going to be wasting a lot of time going through the history. So I make a snapshot.
And at least I know I have a, and I give it some kind of a name, you know, version one, version two, version three, or, you know, whatever it is that is uh, relevant to you. But if you don't do that and you want to go back in the history, you can say, gee, I know that before I convert it to black and white, I want to go back there. Well, you can see here, um, convert to black and white right here. So if I click right before convert to black and white, that's the spot before we convert it to black and white and started making changes. But if you want to go to color, but maintain the brushes, then you're out of luck because it's chronological order. All right, thanks very much, folks. I appreciate it. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.